We're just half an hour away from the open of Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. You're watching The China Show. I'm Yvonne Mann. Our top stories this morning, Asian stocks fall as more Fed officials hose down rate cut hopes. Treasuries are stabilizing after that sell-off that pushed two-year yields back towards that 5% level. TSMC and other chip makers in focus after it slashes its outlook for market expansion on persistent consumer weakness. And I'm Medica Doshi in Chennai, India. Polls are about to open in a few minutes from now, kicking off a six-week-long election in which almost one billion voters will decide whether to hand Narendra Modi a third five-year term as Prime Minister. Well, it's happy Friday. Not so if you are along these risk assets. You take a look at how stocks are doing here this morning. It really is the prospect of that H word that's emerged among the Fed speak that maybe, you know, you can't rule out the possibility of a rate hike. That's what we've been hearing from some Fed officials overnight. So that certainly is roiling once again the bond market. Although uh, we talked about things have kind of calmed down just a bit. But yeah, 496, though, for your two year yield. We're getting ever so close to the 5% level. When do we see that for the 10 year? That certainly is a question of the day that we're asking our viewers as well. So you're seeing that sell-off uh, across Australia. Japan, we're watching very closely as well. The VOJ does meet next week, mind you. And you know, j equities are get basically getting hit. Look, take a look at Nikkei. We're down some 2% two, two, uh, 2 or more. Cosby's down 1%. The tech sector certainly gets, gets hit once again. And you're seeing Taipei opening up down close to 2% on the TIEX here this morning. That's likely going to be dragged by the likes of TSMC, just given that earnings outlook for them. Basically, they kept CapEx outlook unchanged for the full year. Also, when it comes to the foundry business, uh, that uh, sales were actually forecasted to be sub 20%. So maybe there's still some weakness when it comes to smartphones and PCs, even with those AI tailwinds, doesn't seem to be helping and lifting the sector. So you're seeing there, TSMC, we're down some 4% at the open in Taipei. Following what we saw in the ADRs overnight, the supply chain, some of these Taiwanese suppliers are also falling in tandem. And we're watching that across the region here, across Japan and Korea this morning. If you take a look at how Samsung is looking like, like some SK Hynix and in Japan, we're continuing to see that downdrift when it comes to chip makers. So once again, there's caution in the wind when it comes to where we are in this recovery. Samsung's down some 2.5%. There you go. And the Golden Dragon Index, we did see a bit of a pop there overnight. Obviously, there's some superlatives there that we're certainly tracking, right? The CSI 300 set for the best weekly gain since late February. On the flip side, Hong Kong is on track for the biggest weekly loss since early February. So certainly that's something that we're watching very closely here, this divergence that we've been seeing. Japan, we, I forgot to mention, we're actually heading to the worst week so far this year. And the S&P is, is basically on a three-week losing streak as well. If these 50 futures are doing this here right now, we're basically flat when it comes to that benchmark here. Chinese 10-year two -year yields are basically still around those 2002 lows at 225 and 725.33 for your dollar China trade here this morning. We'll see if we see any more weakness when it comes to the currency and what that PPOC fix is going to bring. But of course, that dollar also set for a second straight week of gains for the greenback. In terms of what to watch here, we talk about that UN support from the PBOC. Some lines came through in that presser in the afternoon yesterday talking about the cautious tone on monetary policy, although there's still room for that as well. We're watching some of these technical levels in the CSI 300 as well as the Shanghai Composite here. Uh, we're focusing on stock market reform. This nine-point plan and what it really means for the markets here and the IPO outlook, certainly with UBS a little bit later on. We talked about the chip stocks in China as well, and we're still talking about earnings, right? So the likes of Hangzhou Hikvision, some of the telcos like China Tower, China Unicom that are going to be reporting a little bit later on today. I want to bring in our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, now. We heard from the PBOC yesterday. It was interesting, though. It seemed like they, were, they said there was room for monetary policy, but they also don't want those rates too low 
and, and the chance that it might actually lead to prices going lower, more competitive when it comes to business and the like. So it seems like that threshold for rate cuts is still pretty high right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they are concerned, obviously, by excessive volatility in the FX markets and at too fast a pace of decline given the dollar strength in the renminbi. Uh, and again, they say they're going to resolutely, that's a common word that the Beijing authorities use, they will resolutely uh, support the yuan, especially when traders place excessive bets against it. Uh, and so a little bit of job boning going on here. Obviously, uh, they've been allowing, when we've been watching that daily fix, which we'll be watching in just in a few minutes, uh, they've been allowing a slow pace of depreciation. They do not want excessive uh, you know, moves uh, to the downside on the renminbi to spark potential outflow. So we'll be watching that one very closely. Especially if the Fed discussions remains higher for longer. Look, absolutely. And uh, Japan and South Korean officials are talking about the same thing. They're concerned. And then there it raises the question, could there be some sort of joint intervention uh, with you know, Japan and the United States, you know, hi, you know, hi, hypothetical right now, but essentially to uh, kind of quash that king yeah. dollar right now. Is there something brewing there yeah. uh, in, in the currency space? We've also heard from want more from the likes of Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic, also New York Fed President John Williams overnight. Both of them are signaling the fight against inflation is far from over. Inflation is high, it's too high, and we need to get it to our 2% target. The pathway to 2% is going to be slower than people expect, uh, and it'll be bumpy. I'm of the view that Things are going to be slow enough this year that we won't be in a position uh, to reduce our rates uh, toward, until toward the end of the year. It's not my baseline. My expectation right now is that you know, interest rates are in a good place and eventually at some point would want to lower interest rates as the economy really gets to the 2% inflation that we're headed towards. If the data are telling us that we would need higher interest rates to achieve our goals, uh, then we would, we would obviously want to do that. So it's not my base case. Let's bring in Jack McIntyre now, portfolio manager at Brandywine Global. And Jack, I know you're in a kind of lonely camp now that, that thinks that maybe bond markets can still deliver some positive returns this year. How has this year been for you so far? So, you know, not surprising. It, it's been challenging, you know, the, the move higher uh, in, in yields. You know, I am sort of a a little bit of a lone wolf, still trying to stay constructive on bonds. Uh, you know, you, you're getting some capitulation folks that have been bullish on bonds. It's always been a little bit of a, a timing issue uh, in here of, you know, when all when is all the, the, the full effect of the monetary policy tightening, the sort of uh, less fiscal impulse kind of kicking in to slow the economy. But, you know, it's taking longer than um, certainly anticipated. But it doesn't mean it's it's not going to happen. It's just getting pushed out a little further. I mean, what I mean, is there really a possibility of of, of just no hikes, I mean, no cuts this year, let alone, I mean, the fact that they're even talking about a, a hike in the picture, I mean, is, is that likely going to be something that could actually still be, you know, come true this year, Jack? So it could. I mean, you know, you've got your three scenarios. There's, you know, it's the, the hard landing, which was kind of last year's theme, and then this year coming into it was that soft landing. But now you certainly have to have uh, or introduced into the conversation the concept of of no landing uh, right now. And again, I'm not, you know, Williams, to, you know, to, uh, yesterday certainly, you know, said it's not his base case. Um, you know, I, I think the way I'm viewing the Fed is that high for longer it means, OK, rates are just we're not going to get cuts, but they're not going to tighten. If, if the, the verbiage is starting to be higher uh, for longer, then that means, yeah, we're going to have to start to see uh, some rate hikes. But remember, uh, you know, we go back to what's going on with equities. You know, that's the rally in equities meant that financial conditions were easing, which was frustrating the Fed. If this sell-off gets a little bit more traction, we obviously know there's going to be some wealth destruction, and that's going to go back to tightening financial conditions. It's going to do a lot of the work for the Fed if it continues, which I think it will. Okay. Um, then my question is, how, how, do you think we've seen the, 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 a ceiling when it comes to Treasury yields now? I mean, we, we did briefly touch that 5% for the two-year. Could, could we see actually higher yields from there, or, or is that certainly a, sort of a cap now? 
Well, I think it, so. In the in the front end, uh, you, you could get a move up to five and a quarter that area. Something it, you know, right now the market has still pricing in some rate cuts this year. It's obviously a lot less than what we started. So if we go and the market prices out all of those rate cuts, yeah, you're going to get a little higher, uh, sort of that maybe five five and a quarter area uh, on on two years. So the, was, your your question of the day is the real. Uh, kicker, you know, is 10-year yields going to get to 5%. <laughs> and what's your answer to that? Oh, <laughs> oh you wanted me to answer. Okay. Uh, well, that one, I don't, so I, we're not positioned for that. We don't expect that. Having said that, uh, you know, if this no landing gets a little bit more traction, but my view is to get to 5%, it's going to be post-U.S. election. And it's going to be if if the Democrats sweep, meaning you know Biden wins, gets Congress, if Trump wins and gets Congress, then I'd say, hey, there's a more likelihood we're going to get there. Absent that, uh, I don't think so. You know, remember the the fiscal impulse since that rate of change in the U.S. It's still high, but it's 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 negative. It's not as high as it was last year. So we don't have that same fiscal imp impulse that we got there last fall, last time that we got to 5% uh, on 10-year yield. So short answer, I don't think we're going to get there. But hey, if I'm wrong, I think you're supposed to buy bonds. <laughs> hey, Jack, Stephen Engel here. If I could just jump in, uh, we're just seeing Brent oil prices climbing above 88 bucks a barrel as Mideast uh, risks have been uh, escalated. How does that factor into your outlook as far as inflation and just the overall tensions in the Middle East as it plays on the markets? Yeah, so this is uh, oil's been challenging in here. You know, actually, the last uh, oh, 18 months, it's actually been a pretty core, pretty strong correlation with yields. And then, you know, at the end of the day, conflict is ultimately inflationary. So higher oil prices, uh, you know, it's it's a growth tax. You know, it gets you towards sort of stagflation because it hurts the lower income folks um, from a growth standpoint because they have to allocate more capital. To spending on uh, on energy, um, I think you know again my my view in the Middle East is just things aren't going to get to deteriorate. But you know that's certainly a fat tail event and could I would feel being more constructive on bonds. Clearly, I'd like to see oil prices uh, head lower uh, uh, in, in here, and um, you know that last sort of five percent sort of move I think is more tied into Middle East pressures than sort of global economic fundamentals. Um, I want to get your take on, on CGBs. It, it looks like you've you recently purchased some of them as a hedge. There, there's talk of maybe, you know, there's not much room really for the PBOC to cut rates moving forward, just given where, how weak the currency is and how low yields are already. Do you think there's more in this rally? So, you know, the way we uh, acquired them was the, through the lens of sort of still being underweight, but just less convicted. So we have about half the index exposure. But part of it is that this idea of sort of, you know, China kind of uh, going through this sort of Japification process, the demographics, all that sorts of things. I don't think um, the, the yields are going to be a a home run right trade. I just didn't want to, I don't have the conviction of not having any Chinese bond exposure in our portfolios. I see. Okay. I, I want to ask you about currencies because that's really where we're seeing a lot of the volatility these days. Uh, the fact that we're seeing that the U.S. is acknowledging some of the concerns that Japan and Korea right. have on their currencies at the moment. Is there something brewing here, you think, Jack? We, could we see some sort of joint intervention or some sort of, you know, plaza accord? You know, a mini, I'd say, if anything, maybe, maybe a mini plaza accord. But but you're right. And it's tough, you know, to say that that is ultimately going to happen. But clearly, currencies have moved enough to start to to work their way into the conversation, both in terms of government level, central bank level. And um, uh, so, I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised, uh, you know, in an inflationary environment, you, people don't want, their countries don't want weak currencies. Weak currencies exacerbate inflation. Uh, the fact that the U.S. Is, is, has acknowledged that, um, we could, we could be seeing uh, something. And certainly, obviously, coordinated intervention is going to be a lot more powerful than sort of uh, unilateral intervention. 
Jack, it's great to have you. Have a great weekend. Jack McIntyre there, portfolio manager at Brandywine Global. As we just mentioned here, there's been quite a bit of a movement when it comes to the bond market, and maybe Jack is true, that maybe some of these geopolitical risks and the risk to oil prices and the like could lead to that safe haven bid for Treasuries right now. We're seeing the entire curve basically shifting lower and extending those declines on yields across the curve. And Brent crude as well. Take a look at that. We're seeing that spike up about 1.5% as we're starting to see more of these tensions in the Middle East as well. Nothing to clarify just yet of anything new in terms of developments, but certainly those Middle East risks are weighing and making those yields quite heavy here this morning in the Asia session. Take a look at that. We're down some six basis points for the two-year at 492, 456 for your U.S. 10-year yield. And the dollar on the back foot of that as well is strengthening against Asia FX once again. We're counting down the open of trade in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. This is The China Show. Fix just crossing through your Bloomberg here this morning, and once again, it is holding steady at 71046. So I believe it's a fourth session that we've seen that 710 fixing there. Uh, but this, of course, as they try to counter that weight from that rising dollar, which we continue to see this morning across Asia FX here today. We talked about the dollar hitting uh, two weeks of gains already, and now there's a lot of chatter about Middle East tensions as well. That is really kind of putting that safe haven bid on the dollar here, as well as in Treasuries here this morning. There's a lot going on. We'll see if we can get any more clarity in the next few minutes or so. One thing we're watching very closely is TSMC as well. Shares in Taipei, of course, reacting for the first time to those uh, earnings that we got yesterday. Now, there you go. We're down some 5%. Uh, that's after it scaled back its outlook for a chip market expansion and cautioning that the smartphone and personal computing sectors remain weak. Let's get to our Asia tech reporter, Jane Lanhee Lee. She's with us now. I, I mean, were the earnings good or bad, Jane, is one thing. It seems like the reactions are mixed. Yeah, the reactions really were mixed. And if you see some of the analyst notes coming in, uh, some of them are still bullish. And that's because they're also focusing on the AI market. And for the AI market, TSMC has made comments like it's very, very good, looking good going forward. They're expecting, uh, you know, uh, massive growth in that market, 50% year on year for the next five years. But we have to remember that only makes up a very small part of TSMC. Sees uh, revenue so far. What was interesting is that, you know, in January we had an in person meeting for uh, the Q4 earnings call, and that was super bullish. There were very few things that were negative. And yesterday there was, it's not clear, it was online and there was an IT issue. We were on hold for 20 minutes until we could. Um, get the call going. I don't know if if that's dampened sentiment. But I went back and, and looked at the transcript and there were so many sort of cautious words like we're we're uh, readjusting uh, our outlook or or uh, it's not, you know, growing as as uh, fast. The recovery isn't as steep as we expected. And so there were all these words, you know, it, answer after answer after answer that really toned down the entire uh, earnings call, despite the fact that, you know, uh, they beat um, first quarter earnings uh, and then their outlooks also uh, for TSMC were pretty good. So, you know, it's uh, it's I think it's a lot of that texture that has scared people away and their overall market look, which they say doesn't really impact them because they're really sitting on the on the uh, advanced edge. Hey, Jane, Steve Engel here. You know, I just wanted to pick up on that because, yeah, there's, there's, it's a mixed reaction, obviously, because, uh, you know, they've kept CapEx the same as last year. Uh, but again, you know, that outlook for chips down to about 10 percent growth kind of overshadowing the revenue beat. They beat revenue. And again, AI is the big, you know, buzzword. But how much of that is really contributing to that revenue gain? Yeah, it's still, you know, I think what they're looking at is 13% uh, this year. So that's that's not a lot. Um, and even if that continues to grow, App, Apple, uh, of course, it doesn't disclose it, but uh, last year it says uh, our customer A, our biggest customer, had 25% uh, of the revenue. So when you think of that, um, 
smartphone market, PC market, these things still do matter. And when it came to uh, servers, traditional servers, not AI servers, you hear things like, oh, it's, it's really not great. So a lot of that is really um, creating a bit of negative sentiment, which is reflected in uh, today's stock price. Jane, thank you, Jane Lahey Lee. There, yeah, you're certainly seeing that not just in TSMC, you're seeing the biggest drop in 18 months this morning, but also among the supply chain as well. Um, you know, so obviously we're tracking still very closely these these moves that we're seeing when it comes to treasuries across bread markets and the dollar here this morning. So there's a flight to safety. You're seeing a rapid movement and and buying into now U.S. Treasuries. You take a look at how the U.S. two years looking like we're down some close to five basis points uh, to 4.93. So we're basically off that five percent threshold people were worried about here today. And Brent markets take a look at that, a pop of two percent or so. Dollar is also catching a bid here once again. So this is on, of course, the the Middle East re risks that we've been seeing. Obviously, we saw overnight U.S. Uh, you know implementing sanctions on Iran as well. So certainly focusing more on the news flow here this morning. Your your China futures and your setup to the Hong Kong market. The pre-market is looking like this here right now. Obviously, we've seen a bit of a downdrift when it comes to Hong Kong stocks this week. CSI 300 has actually outperformed, comparatively speaking. Hang saying, there you go. We're seeing it really comparable to what we're seeing in the rest of the region here. We're down some eight tenths of one percent in the pre-market. AP futures continue to extend those declines here. 725 for dollar China. This is Bloomberg. All right, take a look at when it comes to your pre-market in Hong Kong. It is going to be a day of risk aversion, it seems, just given what we're hearing. Now, I want to stress, this is unverified media reports right now, but there have been some reports of explosions in Iran, Syria, and Iraq. That's why you're seeing such a fierce reaction on some of these risk assets here today. Uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but certainly we talk about the outperformance of the CSI 300 over Japan just this week, though. But you know, there's so much else going on when it comes to oil markets and what you're seeing in treasury markets here right now. Analysts actually to tell you about, we're focusing on the commodity space, Jiangxi Copper, H shares cut to a hold at HSBC. But then again, we're having another differing view from Citi. They actually raised to a buy for that stock here with a price target of $25. And Prada reinstated overweight at JP Morgan there. Uh, in terms of what we're watching and stocks to watch, it's the oil stocks in particular, just given what we've been seeing with, with Brent, that pop of 2% in just the last couple of minutes or so. You're watching a kind of a mixed picture among some of these commodities uh, and energy players here today. But there you go. You've seen China oil field services down some 1%. Oil contracts. We're taking some of the and tracking some of the most active ones in the last four months or so. And this is what you're seeing there uh, across the curve. It is basically seeing uh, more geopolitical risk being weighed and, play and factored in. And there you go. Take a look at your safe haven assets here. So the dollar treasuries and oil basically bid up here this morning. Gold futures are also up. We're back above that 2400 level. We'll see if we, we'll see any more clarity on the Middle East side of things. You're watching The China Show. on this Friday morning thinking that we'd be worried about all this hawkish Fed speak, but in the last couple minutes or so, it seems like traders are waking up to a little bit more of potential revival of Middle East tensions. Now, we talk about, I specify, unverified reports now of explosions that we're hearing in Iran, Iraq, and Syria right now. We're still waiting for any sort of update on what's going on, but the market's already moving ahead of itself here right now. You take a look at how risk assets are doing. There's a flight to safety across Treasury, so yields are down across the curve there. Also, when it comes to Brent markets and oil markets are peaking higher here this morning, and we're watching very closely what goes on. There's a wave of a sell-off here when it comes to equities across the region. In fact, we're seeing the Asia benchmark now dropping the lowest that we've seen since February 14th. So you take a look at how the Hang Seng is looking like in this open, and there you go. We continue to see declines across the board. We're already talking about the Hang Seng, set for one of the worst weeks we've seen since early February. We're down some 1% here this morning. The CSI 300 is taking it a little bit more in stride and seeing a little bit less 
downside. We're down about half of 1%. So this divergence between onshore and offshore continues here today. But take a look at HS Tech. That's where you're going to see all that hawkish Fed speak, the, the geopolitical risk and all that really playing down. We're seeing that really get hit by 1.5% on HS Tech here. And take a look at Shanghai Crude. It's flat right now, but you're watching the rest of the markets and commodities are getting uh, certainly a risk premium there and catching a bit this morning. We're watching that weakness in, in the currency as well, 720. Six, I believe, is what I'm seeing. 725, 26 here right now. It once again, it was a 710 handle for that PBOC fix, and amidst this dollar strength, it really, you can't quite do much more than that right now because it, it seems like Asia FX is really at the mercy of what that stronger dollar is doing here this morning and you're seeing some of these small caps actually fall as well. Volatility is picking up on the HSI. You take a look at in terms of your global macro movers here and we're already seeing 3% declines in Japan this morning. So you're watching that in the TIEX we're down some 3%. That TSMC story certainly is, is what's dragging that but really the tech heavy benchmarks like the Cosby as well is down some 2%. US futures are also down by more than 1% here. So it seems like those Middle East tensions is what's really front of mind right now, Steve. And the commodities sector, take a look at that, is blaring green. Yeah, and we're again trying to figure out what uh, is actually happening in the Middle East. There was a post on X, if mm. you've seen this as well, uh, from al Mahadeen English, a news service, uh, correspondent in Baghdad saying an explosion was heard, the cause of which was unknown. It's in the Imam district of the Babel governorate in southern Iraq. Uh, uh, again, we're still trying to piece together why there is this flight to safety uh, across the markets because of whatever is happening in the Middle East right now. Yep. Uh, still a lot of uncertainty, of course. We'll see, see if we can verify any of this right now. But yeah, the fact that we're seeing a drop of 3% on the Nikkei 225 is certainly something here right now. And we talked about Asia FX just getting pummeled. Look at the, the South Korean won. Once again, we are getting very ever closer to that 1400 level. We're weakening some 1% across the board there. And you're seeing EMFX in Asia basically getting hit substantially. And the flight to safety, I mean, that U.S. five-year yield is down some 10 basis points here right now. So it seems like what we're hearing in the Middle East for now is really catching a lot of people off guard. They were not expecting this as well um, from, you know, very different from what we've heard in the last few sessions or so. Um, and WTI, you're seeing 85 bucks for WTI. Brent crude, we're getting closer back to that $90 Hand at level now. Shang, you know, you're seeing like copper in Shanghai is, is surging some 2% as well. Iron ore is doing an opposite story, but gold, there you go. We're back above that 2400 level, which is, I believe, a record high. Uh, we're around the, at, at those levels here right now, just given this flight to safety. We thought we would just be talking about <laughs> rate hikes no. and the possibility, but now there's just a lot more. And, and I think, you know, the geopolitical risk factor, we're still something that people are just don't know even know how to price this at this moment. Yeah, absolutely, because there's so much uncertainty. We don't yeah. know exactly what happened. So there's an immediate pullback right now with the MSCI Asia Pacific down about 1.8%. The Nikkei down 3% right now. Gold, again, on the opposite side, going up above $2,400. So uh, we're going to be watching this very closely. Oil also up um, towards Brent crude about 88 bucks a barrel, going up about 2%. So... Again, we're going to try to get you the, the news as we know it. It's it interesting that you're actually seeing that flight to, to safety in treasuries, right? I mean, yeah. a lot of, in the last couple of days or so has been really just tuned into the whole Fed speak. But the fact that higher for longer or high for longer, as Jack McIntyre had, you know, could lead to maybe treasury yields to stay elevated for some time. But, you know, just news and, and maybe just the fact that there's no you know, certainty on the news right now is just basically you're seeing those traditional havens actually uh, go catch a bit here. I'm looking at dollar yen. I want to see how that's doing, though. 154.16. Okay, so this is still the one that's... Well, you're still seeing some strength, but it's still marginal compared to some of the other you know, assets that we've seen. 154 still uh, holding to those levels right now. Let's bring in our Garfield Reynolds, who leads our Markets Live Asia coverage. Um, Garfield, what's happening? What's happening? <laughs> Well, none of us really know for sure. You know, there are some, so far, very much unconfirmed reports of explosions in Iran, in Iraq, in Syria. The obvious you know, line that people will be drawing, that the dots they will be joining there, is that this could be you know, a response from Israel you know, to the Iran attack. It did promise one. However, there's absolutely no proof that that's the case. The concern that the markets are obviously very much expressing is that you know, Middle East tensions are going to ramp up much, much further. Yeah. We had been looking at the weekend attacks 
and from Iran and saying, well, they were massive, but they didn't do any real damage. There was a path there towards a calmer situation in the Middle East. That path seems to have evaporated. And so we've got some extraordinary moves breaking out just now in assets with your know, five-year Treasury yields down 10 basis points. You know, really that comes after yesterday's jump. But you, you also have uh, gold had been rallying. Not sure if it still is, but you know, gold was rallying. The Swiss franc has been rallying. Mostly the US dollar has been climbing against its peers. There's a massive rapid move towards what are perceived as being safer assets, even if actually right now it's hard to say that any assets are actually safe. There are just you know, right. less dangerous ones, so to speak. Hey, Garfield, we're just getting further reports from other unsubstantiated uh, newspapers at the Jerusalem Post saying these are alleged Israeli strikes reported in Iran, Syria, Iraq. Uh, so again, this does absolutely, if this does come to fruition and it is uh, substantiated, it raises the risk premium considerably, doesn't it, across the board? Well, I mean, very much uh, you know, when you consider that uh, Iran uh, had been pushing the idea that uh, it saw the matter as being closed uh, and that you know, therefore it wouldn't be doing anything more. This raises the risk that Iran will look to do more. Then you have uh, the concerns that how is the US going to respond? How is Europe going to respond? And for everything also, we now have uh, a situation where, if nothing else, crude oil prices are going to get much more elevated again. That's going to put pressure on risk assets across uh, the region. You also have uh, you know, a potentially unfortunate sort of timing coincidence. It's Friday, and again, instead of having a day where people can be you know, looking to wind down what they've been doing during the week, uh, you know, sort of close off uh, their trades if they want to do that or say, yeah, we're happy holding this. Now we've got an end of the week that is again uh, one where the atmosphere is infected by fears. Yep, we're certainly seeing that here right now. Uh, Garfield, thank you, Garfield Reynolds, there, who leads our Marcus Live Asia coverage. And we're tracking, of course, all the price action here this morning. Uh, let's, let's step away for a second, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what we've been hearing in China, of course, has been seeking to end years of speculator-driven trading by pivoting towards value investment. Now, here are some of the highlights from that nine-point guideline that released that was released by the state council last week. We're, we're going into a little bit more of a, dig, a deeper dive into this here this morning. So, uh, you know, encouraging dividends, favoring big stocks. There's scrutiny on listings in particular and trying to wash out or at least weed out some of these zombie companies, Steve. And, and overall, what's the shareholder value to all this and how to protect investors more? Yeah, yeah in a nutshell, the, the authorities in Beijing want to get rid of this boom and bust cycle that they've seen in the stock market. They want to increase, uh, you know, uh, participation uh, by institutional investors and local investors that have the confidence uh, that they can have a long-term investment. So they get a better dividend policy going forward, as well as improve corporate governance, for sure, and also improve the quality of listings, the yeah. IPOs. And, and it's similar to what we heard, right, and, you know, every 10 years. Um, and, and, you know, it's once a decade that you hear these sort of nine-point plans. And you take a look at how, you know, history has, has shown us that you know, it does actually lead to rallies afterwards. I mean, you take a look at 2004, they were talking about stable reform, opening up capital markets. You saw a bit of a pop there uh, in the 2006 sort of time frame. T May 2014, that's when they started promoting the capital market development. And, you know, in a result of that, what happened? Well, the Stock Connect was born. Yeah. And there you go. You, you do see that pick up there soon after. So does April, what we heard this month, really kind of lead to a, a big catalyst across this markets and sustain that sort of long-term trend on that line that we've seen right now? Let's bring in Selena Chang, co-head of ECM Asia and APAC, head of private financing markets at UBS. She joins us here in our Hong Kong studio. Selena, it's great to have you. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, you know, what do you make of, of this? Nightfall? I know we don't know too much about it, but how does it impact the IPO outlook in China? Well, I think it's actually very interesting to think about um, how China is doing it in conjunction with how Korea and Japan has also pushed out all of these corporate governance issues, uh, corporate governance um, plans on the Korea value up and on the Japan in terms of price to book and t uh, value. And I think China is actually going in the same trend. Um, I know that, you know, investors have been shying away uh, from the China market, and that has actually caused a little bit of a, uh, 
a slowdown in terms of the China IPO market. But um, we expect that, you know, uh, with a number of these measures, just like in Japan and Korea and what we have seen and how the markets have developed, um, I think it's, it's going to be quite um, helpful in the, in the midterm. If you're raising the bar on corporate governance and listing requirements, uh, yes, short-term pain, there'll be fewer listings, right? But in the long term, is this going to mean better listings and therefore attract more institutional funds and higher quality investors? I think so. I think for China, for sure, because the new regulations in terms of having CSRC, um, you know, regulating some of the overseas listings, I think that would actually help improve and regulate the market a lot more systematically. And so whilst we're taking that short-term pain, for, for call it however many months, um, we're expecting that to um, revive. Um, as you can see from a lot of the policy in the recent news items that you that has been from the markets, uh, we expect that that should come quite quite soon. Does that benefit or hurt Hong Kong as, as a destination now then? I, want I think it's a short-term pain for a long-term gain. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Hong Kong has been dealing with this drought. I'm just wondering, in, in, what, you know, what, what sort of IPO activity are you expecting for this year? Uh, as well? We're still the revival? We think so. I mean, honestly, we are expecting for the IPO market as soon as some of the regulatory approvals come through, hopefully by, by Q2 or Q3, where you'll see a lot more of that um, IPO activity coming back. And if you think about the trading volume on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange in particular, it has actually gone up in the first quarter. And so that's, you know, good data points for us to reference on. One I know we're looking at is Mobvoi, which is tied to AI. I mean, Hong Kong has not had a tech IPO since January. <laughs> uh, new listings are down considerably. Yeah. So uh, I mean, are we going to be pinning our hopes on these companies a lot of us haven't heard of? There's also a tea company that is coming next yes, week as well. Yes, that yes. could be the biggest IPO since November, I believe. So far. But so I far. think the, the deals that are, that are coming through to the market, we welcome them. We want more and more transactions in the market, but those are relatively of lesser size, to be completely honest. And so, you know, we're really looking into the market for deals that are sort of north of the region of 200, 300 million or plus in terms of offering size. And we expect that those to come probably later on in the year when the regulatory approvals come through. And um, on the other transactions that you mentioned, um, I think AI definitely is a, is a very good thematic. Um, and so we'll be looking forward to, to more in that space. Uh, I just want to hold that thought for a second here. We're, we're getting some more breaking news here. And it looks like it's been at least reported by ABC News now that Israeli missiles have hit the, uh, an Iran site. That's according to a U.S. official. So a little bit more clarity here. Uh, maybe, this is where, maybe this is what we're seeing here, the beginning of some sort of Israeli response to that attack um, on, on Iran. So certainly there, there's a lot of, of talk here. Uh, but what this all means, you're continuing to see, look at the two-year yield at 488 now. So we've broke below that 490 level, and we're still traveling around that 451 level. So we're down 11 basis points, so double-digit drop in yields when it comes to that U you know, U.S. 10-year. And basically, Brent markets continuing to extend those uh, the gains there. We're up close to 3%, and the dollar is catching a bid here as well. So uh, that's what we're hearing so far, that Israeli missiles did hit an Iran site, according to ABC News, according to U.S. officials so far. Um, Selena, there's no way to pivot back to this, but I just have to talk a bit more about other markets that you're looking sure. at. Obviously, you talk about the AI trade. That's really helping markets mm -hmm. like South Korea, Taiwan. Do you think sure. semiconductor IPOs, is that going to be what dominates these markets? Well, we saw the news item on uh, Bain and Kioxia, right? Now, I don't know how true that is, but, you know, that's definitely something that is on investors' mind, or at least in the investment community, that's something that, that everyone's talking about. Um, you know, in the beginning of this year, we did a, a big trade for some of the Korean semis as well, um, and we expect that to continue um, together with Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. I'm still looking at the Hong Kong market. I'm still trying to find. I'm trying to find a the level floor. at which it stabilizes. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. IPO proceeds are down 29 percent on year so far. Uh, where are we going to finish the year at with that, if the sentiment is improving? Um, to be honest with you, I think it was actually dropping at quite a speed for about a year and a half to two years. And we're sort of stabilizing at 16,000 to 18,000 ish. And so we're expecting that. Uh, a lot of the investors tell us that it's they're finding a bottom uh, in terms of where we are for, for this market. And so they're really standing on the sidelines to see when is the right time to actually come back in.
All right, Selena, great to have you, Selena Chen there, co-head of ECM Asia and APAC, head of private financing markets at UBS. Um, I wish we had more time, but really have to focus on what's been going on in the news flow here this morning. Uh, what we're hearing a little bit more of, of these Israeli missiles hitting that Iran site, that's according to what we're hearing from ABC News. Um, we're, we're waiting for more updates here this morning, but they take a look at global macro movers here right now, and you're seeing outsized moves across basically every asset class here this morning. So uh, you're seeing yeah. basically equities getting slammed. Look at the TIEX now. We're down more than 3%. The Nikkei also down some 3% in Tokyo. And, and the dollar is basically catching a bid. The Swiss franc, that's where you're seeing that flight to safety here this morning. You're not seeing that in the yen that as much, but you're seeing EMFX here in Asia just getting hit hard. Look at the South Korean yeah. one. We're weakening some 1.5%. And you're seeing that green panel, that's commodities, right? So you got to check that, that risk premium that's put on oil now. It seems to be, once again, resuming that trade. We're up more than 3% for Brent and getting, oh, there we go. We're back to 90 bucks here right now in the last yeah. few minutes or so. Uh, you know, WTI is getting close to even that 85, 89 85, there you go. 85 to 86. My eyes are bad. Sorry about that. But certainly you're seeing sovereign bonds catching this bid. We talked about that. U.S. futures, look at your stock futures are all deep in red territory here right now, Steve. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we're looking at various different reports. We do have that confirmation, at least through a media uh, and the U.S. official uh, saying that they struck a site. Uh, Israeli missile striking a, striking a site in Iran. However, it is unclear at this moment what the exact target was or the extent of the damage. Uh, footage has been shared on social media, appeared to show anti-aircraft fire striking over the city of Isfahan. This according to the Daily Mail. Uh, that's in central Iran. However, these reports have not yet been confirmed by officials, so we're still waiting to get uh, more confirmation and more um, news of what exactly was uh, stri struck. Yep, and, and we're getting more news. Um, this is a, a away from the, the geopolitical side of things here right now. Uh, the, the Wall Street Journal is also reporting that Apple uh, is removing WhatsApp from its app store on China on a China government order. So we're not hearing too much on that so far, but that's, that came out in the last couple of minutes or so. Um, but we're still focusing very much what goes on in the Middle East here today. That's still going to be our key focus. You're watching some of these uh, Taiwan Semi and Apple suppliers uh, as well. Um, it's not really on this news, though, right? It, it's really what we're seeing, broadly speaking, what's going on in Iran, reportedly, of, of reported missiles from Israel. You know, this is what is really now in the spotlight. Uh, across traders' minds in the market on this Friday morning. Still, there's a lot of uncertainty. That's why traders are moving first, and then and they're selling now, hitting yeah. the pause button and sell button before they even think further. Yeah, because we were getting the news flows before this started happening, uh, that Iran was saying that it was prepared to de-escalate tensions with Israel if uh, they agreed to stop further military moves. Now, if this is another move, obviously, by Israel, that would represent, obviously, an, an escalation now then there's going to be speculation again of, of potential tit for tat. Yeah. And, and that, that's why there's the flight to safety. So the scrutiny is obviously, you know, what sort of response we've seen so far. And if we're hearing about missiles, of course, what, what, what's the damage? What, what are going to be the fatalities at this point? Nothing is, there's no proof of any of that at this moment. Uh, all just speculation, guys, as we say. Um, but certainly we're watching very closely. The reaction on markets is quite fierce right. this morning. It's under the cover of darkness as well in the yeah. Middle East. So... There's a lot of uncertainty. Okay. Um, we, we have to move on for now until we get a little bit more details. Uh, let's talk a little bit more what's happening as well with India. The six-week national elections begin today with the first of nearly one billion eligible voters to begin casting their ballots for more. Let's bring in our Bloomberg News editor, Amenika Doshi, who is outside a polling station in the southern city of Chennai, the capital of Tamil Nadu state. Menika, what's at stake with this election? Well, this is the largest democratic electoral exercise in the world, but not just that. It's also taking place in the fifth largest and fastest growing economy. So that has not just domestic implications, but implications for international growth. Now, as you pointed out, I'm in Chennai, uh, one of the cities that is going to vote in this very first phase. Tamil Nadu is among the southern states in India that have so far resisted Prime Minister Modi's charms. So he needs to win seats in states like Tamil Nadu if he wants to hit the history books 
not just with a third term, but with a super majority of 400 seats and more of the total 543. All right, Medica, thank you so much. We'll come back to you soon, Medica Doshi there, a Bloomberg News editor. Of course, we're still tracking what goes on, not just in India, but really these Middle East tensions and how it's really weighing on this wave of risk aversion here that we're seeing across the Asia Pacific here on this Friday morning. We're going to give you an update coming up next. Plenty more ahead. Keep it here. This is Bloomberg. Uh, we're still tracking, of course, what's been going on, the breaking news here. Uh, still trying to get a bit more clarity of what we're hearing here. According to ABC News, they have been talking to U.S. officials about Israeli missiles that have hit an Iran site. So traders have been waiting for this, but I guess you could also say, just given the, the price action, they were caught off guard about some sort of Israeli response to Iran's attack last weekend. Uh, we certainly have heard the rhetoric between the two escalating. Um, as we heard from even the Israeli Republic earlier, warning against striking its nuclear facilities. This is why you're seeing this across the markets here right now. Equities are getting slammed. Look at the TIEX. We're down to 3%. You add the TSMC news to that, and that's what's dragging that benchmark. And you look at very closely the dollar moves as well. There's a flight to safety in the dollar, the Swiss franc, the euro franc as well. According to our Mark Pranfield, the MLive blog is where the haven of choice is uh, also. We're also watching very closely what goes on with, with oil markets, Steve, and that 3% pop in Brent is certainly showing that geopolitics is now overshouting anything else yeah, in this absolutely. market. And we're still piecing together the news flow that is coming through, which is trickling in, actually. Uh, the latest from the semi-official Iranian news agency saying a blast was heard, and this goes in addition to what I had reported on earlier from the Jerusalem Post, that a blast had been heard near an air base in Iran's Isfahan. Uh, area uh, that again, according to a semi-official uh, Iranian news agency, and of course the flight to safety is happening across oil markets, across gold, uh, and of course the equity markets futures are down across Asia and the Nikkei 225 as well. That's yep, and it's it's really what you're seeing in, in sovereign bonds, where you are you know once again seeing treasuries. You know, forget what the Fed speak here this morning. This is really about what's going on in the Middle East, and you see the 10-year yield dropping some 10 basis points. We're back to 450 levels. That two-year yield, we're, we're far from 5% now. So you're seeing double-digit gains uh, when it comes to treasuries here this morning. You're seeing that across the board when it comes to some of these sovereigns there. Indonesia is the rare exception. Uh, but really, what you're seeing across most of these DMs uh, is where you're seeing that flight to safety. Even JGBs, uh, we're seeing yields ticking lower here this morning. U.S. futures are, are definitely extending those declines here to this morning. We're seeing Eurostock futures as well. Yep. So this continues to be, you know, the, I think it's just the fact that we don't really know too much right now. And, and right now, it's just, let's just think, and, and these knee-jerk reactions is what we're it's, seeing. It's the suddenness. Yes. And Taru Tanana, a strategist at Saxo Capital mm -hmm. Markets, puts it appropriately. The escalation in geopolitical risks was unexpected. First, we had a hawkish Fed, and now geopolitics. That's what people are waking up to this Friday morning, at least in this part of the world. Yep. So if you take a look at how, you know, basically, it's, it's, it's kind of like a one wave of it, right? It's hard to see what's really moving it. But really, everything that's moving now is basically, take a look at the HSEI and H shares right now. Every stock is down. Only a few stocks are up here this morning. It's the safe haven trade that really is being fired up here. Uh, this morning. You got more, Steve. Slight uh, uptick of obviously in the yen. The yen has not necessarily been a safe haven, but is briefly strengthened beyond 154 to the dollar on risk aversion. So the yen seeing some strength here. Yeah, even the yen is catching a slight bid. Back to 154.23, yeah. but still. But still, not, not anything close to what you're seeing with gold. Look at that, 2,422 here right now. And VIX is, is you know, to take a look at when it comes to volatility, that is also perking up across equities here this morning. I want to bring in Annabelle Drewler. She's tracking these markets for us right now. Belle. Obviously, you've been watching all this. I mean, what, what, what's top of mind for you? I mean, I think you've got a lot of different moves that are coming in here, but the one that's really standing out and the biggest casualty out of any sort of tensions in the Middle East comes down to what you see in the oil space. You've got that risk of regional spillover. It's certainly building at this point in time with this potential response that we're getting from Israel on the Iran uh, strikes. So you've got Brent crude spiking here. You're up around $90 a barrel at this point in time. Similar moves coming through for WTI at this point. So that obviously has some 
other implications. You're seeing that flight to, to, to quality, to havens that's coming through. You mentioned the Japanese yen. We're keeping an eye, of course, on what happens in, in bond yields. Uh, also referencing Fed speak as well, but you do have that general retreat uh, coming through at this point in time. It is a story as well that you do see that broad dollar strength that comes through, and you are seeing that reflected right now. Pretty much every single currency here is weaker, with the notable exception, again, another haven play. That's the Swiss franc that is standing out here. Half a, ben, half a percent uh, stronger at this point in time. The Korean won another risk barometer here, down 1.2 percent. Equities-wise, we are just continuing to sell off at this point in the session. Really notable losses that are continuing to build here. Not a great lead in either, given what we have with TSMC, for instance, that more chip play, some earnings. But you can see the likes of the TSMC, uh, Taiwan rather, uh, down 3 percent. The Nikkei there, you can see off around 3 percent as well. Every single market here, you see futures as well. Again, those losses that are building here. You've got Euro stocks that are looking for a drop of 1.7 percent. German DAX futures as well, down 1.8 percent. So broadly, this is a, a story of risk aversion. But you ask me what's front of centre, definitely you want to keep an eye on Brent crude through the session today, Yvonne. Yeah, the MSCI Asia Pacific index down 1.8 percent, heading for its worst a week since June 2022. Obviously, uh, this is leading into this uh, because of the Middle East tensions. Yeah, that's right. And certainly, as we said, it's just that, that general risk of tone that was already not a great session leading into it. I mean, you already had that concern around Fed speak, that risk of all those chances of perhaps even a, a Fed rate hike uh, coming onto the horizon here. But as we said, we are getting this reporting coming through this morning. We are hearing perhaps that Iran uh, has, has uh, been the subject of a strike from Israel uh, in retaliation, of course, for the weekend strike where Israel uh, pushed out or sent 300 missiles in the direction of Tel Aviv. But certainly it is uh, a very much a developing story at this point in time, that reporting first coming through from the ABC. Uh, other things that we're tracking here today is we said that focus on gold. It is that flight to quality that we see. Safe havens very much in playing gold. It's an asset that has just absolutely been on a rise over the course of this year, uh, given this geopolitical risk that's on the horizon. A lot of buying coming through from central banks as well. But gold futures, you can see that that spike up more than 1% at this, at this point in the session. That spike that you see as well for VIX futures, uh, you're trading back near that 19 mark at this point in time. Bond yields, uh, a little changed really, but still we are seeing, as we said, that, that, that move that we have in the Swiss franc. That's a story there of Swiss, Swiss franc strength against the euro but broadly the swiss franc is higher up around half a percent at this time of on yep we're certainly seeing that thank you so much for that update annabelle of course coming in uh last minute to really help us out with all this coverage here this morning just given what we're hearing so the associated press this is the latest you know news that we're getting when it comes to the impact on airlines okay. so emirates and fly dubai steve have diverted around western iran we certainly have heard this before yes. you know during the weekend events with iran that you know, all these airlines were trying to go through more kind of a detour and lengthy routes just to get through some of these air spaces obviously i mean the reports are centered around isfahan uh, which is west of the capital tehran about 215 miles uh, and essentially home to a major air base for the iranian military as well as sites associated with its nuclear program a uh, very interesting development and obviously uh, you know these are sort of unannounced diversions by a number of flights according to uh, Associated Press. Commercial flights began diverting their routes early Friday morning over western Iraq without explanation as one semi-official news agency uh, in Iran said there had been explosions heard near that city, Isfahan. So again, that's where we would be uh, we have not gotten further reports, though, as we heard earlier on this morning, that there were also yeah. explosions in Syria and in Iran. They have not been substantiated either. And, and this is a very busy airspace, right? The Iran airspace in particular, um, which has been used by, by airlines traveling between Europe, India, Southeast Asia as well. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of complexities here. It hasn't just been about the, the Middle East, you know, but airlines really have been contending with a whole set of challenges uh, with the Russia invasion of Ukraine as well. So uh, obviously, we're tracking the airlines and how the impact it is there. But we are hearing more of these diversions here uh, and quite lengthy diversions uh, for the past week now already, given just these Middle East tensions here. So there you go. Gold getting close to 2430 here this morning. Um, obviously, we're, we're waiting to hear any sort of, I don't think we 
heard the officials no. confirm it at this moment. The Iranian government has offered no immediate comment, and I just want to correct myself. Isfahan is 215 miles to the south of Tehran, but you're absolutely right. It is a heavy air corridor for commercial flights uh, from Asia to Europe. So. Yeah, so certainly that's going to be one to watch here. And of course, if we get any more sort of clarity on these explosions here this morning, let's do a quick check on some of these markets really overall. Um, so we talked about Brent. That's where you're going to see most of that buying this morning. And it's basically just a sea of red for most risk assets here today. You're going to feel it across equities. You're going to feel it across the you know, Asia FX here this morning. Um, but the traditional havens, at least even treasuries now, are reacting to this in a quite a big way, I might add, which we haven't seen for some time. Yeah, soon. and again, it's a bit of a triple whammy on the markets uh, with these geopolitical risks. You have uh, the, the hawkish Fed. You have, again, the TSMC worries on the chips, uh, all secondary now, uh, according to, uh, you know, now that we have these risks. Uh, rising in the Middle East. Yep. So there you go. Um, so two-year yields, yields. That's you know most of the the buying seems to be in in the belly of the curve and maybe towards the longer end. So we're at the U.S. five-year yields at 455, uh, 452 for your U.S. 10-year. So that 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 flatness still continues here this morning, but 489. I mean we were still talking about when. You know, earlier this morning we were going to talk. The question of the day was, are we going to see five percent for the U.S. 10-year yield? We're, we're way off that now. Uh, because of these geopolitical tensions here, 452 right now as we speak. Um, are, are we reading some other story, you know, other mark movers? I mean, obviously the energy players are certainly one that's going to be in focus here today. Airlines, there you go. You are seeing, of course, a downdrift when it comes to these airlines and what they're going to have to do to try to at least divert around the, the Iranian airspace or even in Iraq and Syria has, has been reported uh, uh, right now. Uh, defense stocks is certainly something that we're watching very closely here in the region as well. So perhaps they're, they're, you know, we have to continue to watch that as well. Bell, you're watching, of course, some of these movers. W what are you looking at? Uh, I'm just looking at that huge amount of market reaction we are getting today against pretty much every single asset class at this point in time. What the GMM function really tells you at this point is that this is a big flight to safety that we are seeing that's being expressed through that move that you're seeing here in bond yields, for instance. You're seeing it reflected in dollar strength. Uh, pretty much every single currency is weaker now with that notable exception. Again, another haven bid here, the Swiss franc. We even saw the Japanese yen strengthening uh, 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 in the session so far. The big moves as well, of course, come coming through in oil and you've got Brent crude again very close to that $90 a barrel mark WTI likewise up 3% uh, actually uh, going into the session today we had every single sector in the red it's still that story except with the notable uh, exception of oil or energy linked stocks but broadly you can see here those losses that are just continuing to build in the equity session you've got at the Tykes for instance that is an outsized move we're seeing here given it's uh, got this uh, black box but you can see that's an outsized move that we have for the Thai they They're down 3%. Uh, of course, TSMC earnings casting another shadow here, but every single market here in negative territory and slipping that you also see reflected so far in futures. The outlook for Euro stocks, for instance, are guiding for a more than or around a 2% drop. The same for the German DAX at this point in time. FTSE futures, likewise, 1.2% in negative territory. That is the state of play that we see here. But let's change on because you mentioned some of the movers we're tracking in particular. Uh, defense stocks, a key watch for us. And you can see, likewise, we are getting gains coming through uh, given these geopolitical tensions, this risk that we see of a broader conflict now in the Middle East, given the headlines that are coming through, that uh, Iran is saying that Israel threats could spark a shift in its nuclear policy, and that's been one of the key watches. Uh, likewise, energy stocks, as I said, they are climbing off the back of this, the single loan sector in the, in the green so far in the session. Brent crude, as I said, up around $90 a barrel at this point in time, guys. Okay. Thank you so much, Bell. Um, I'm taking a look at some of the new, there's state TV now. There seems to be more reports coming through. So a heavy blast in Iran's central Isfahan province, which Steve was talking to just a bit earlier on about this city and the proximity that we're seeing these explosions to the airport yes. as well as the air base as well. So State TV at least confirming that explosion here right now. Yeah, it, it's home to an international airport. It's home to an Iranian military base. It is also near Iran's nuclear program or facilities. Which yeah. makes this very interesting, given there has been talk, uh, you know, from from Iran that if 
Israel had not pulled back on its aggressive stance, that they would have to start looking at ramping up its nuclear program as well. I don't know if these are tied. Again, we're just trying to piece together the news flow, which has been trickling in, and that's why the flight to safety is happening. We just don't have the, the definitive answer right now on, on all and, this. And you got to wonder, you know, we talked about the diplomacy leading up to this, uh, of whether the U.S. and its allies were able to rein in Israel and their response. Right. Um, there's been a lot of calls and, and, and from France, from, you know, from Europe as well, to, to try to at least tame and restrain. I don't know if what we're seeing right now is, is, is the restraint. We're, st we're still trying to figure out the magnitude, of course, of these missiles here this morning. That's why markets are acting first. Let's bring in Garfield Reynolds. He heads our MLive Asia coverage here. Uh, once, more, once more, thanks so much for coming on. I mean, obviously, there's still a lot of uncertainty. We're getting a little bit more news flow and confirmation, potentially, Garfield. But, you know, what's caught your eye? Well, one of the things that's caught my eye is that Chinese stocks have been relatively calm, uh, and even they're rebounding slightly. The Hang Seng Index has come way back up. Uh, that's accompanied you know, a, a little bit of an easing off in the levels of concern across other assets. You know, equities were always going to be down across much of the region today because of what the lead was overnight when it came to you know, hawkish Fed potential. Uh, but now the Middle East has, has overwhelmed all of that. And right now, as you were stressing, people, we're sort of watching and waiting and trying to work out what exactly has gone on, how serious is this, will this ratchet tensions up dramatically from where they had seemed to be a couple of days ago, or will it just keep them simmering away? And we don't know until we get, we don't even have any clear information on you know, what, if anything, these explosions have, have been involved with, how Iran is taking them. Uh, so it, it's very much an extremely muddy setup for markets in Asia today. And understandably, we've seen these very strong risk aversion moves that sent Treasury yields dropping 10 basis points today after some of them rose 10 basis points yesterday. And certainly they'd risen a lot this week. Well, Garfield, obviously there is a vacuum on the news flow, so that is exacerbating the level of sell-off. But doesn't this really just show how nervous markets have really been about a potential flare-up in the Middle East? Well, I think what it actually reveals is that th there's, there's nervousness there, but also that markets were really struggling to price in the risks because uh, you know, we're all... We're talking about, you know, can the U.S. restrain Israel? Uh, you know, how is Iran going to, de to develop its stance? These are all things that, in fact, military strategists and political strategists have been struggling somewhat to work out, you know, how that's going to play out going forward. And markets have to be reactive to that. They've been also wondering, you know, how do we price it? Uh, obviously, you know, you oil is going to go on being perhaps the single most sensitive asset and also I think you know, there's a ratchet effect every time we get one of these episodes you're going to adjust up sli slightly or more than slightly where you see oil sustaining so we had a pullback earlier this week in oil there was a strong argument to be made that the path for oil to move higher had become clearer even with that ratcheting down in tensions we saw earlier in the week. So even if we end up getting some sort of an all clear, if uh, the more extreme moves across assets today fade away, you're still going to, my biggest takeaway from all of this would be precisely that you can't expect a sustained decline in oil prices as long as you have no clear path to a sustainably more peaceful or less warlike Middle East situation. All right, Garfield, hold on that thought. We're going to have more, uh, some no more news coming through here. So you take a look at uh, the Iranian news agency, semi-official. So Mare, I think that's how you pronounce it. So more flights that we're learning have been suspended in several Iran airports following those explosions near that city of Isfahan. So that's according to what we're seeing here right now. Obviously, the cause of this blast is still yep. unknown.
According to some reports as well, though, U.S. officials have said it was Israeli missiles that have hit uh, that Iran site as well. But yes, what are you seeing, Steve? I'm, I'm seeing a report from ABC News citing those U.S. officials saying, again, we have not substantiated this report, but essentially uh, that report from ABC News through U.S. officials is saying that more than 300 drones and missiles were aimed at Israeli defense forces at targets within Iran. Isfahan was one of the main cities that we've had other reports and why those flights have been diverted around the parts of southern uh, Iran, uh, about 215 miles south of the the capital Tehran. So that's what we have right now. Uh, Garfield, I guess we're just going to be on tender hooks on the markets until we get clear information on how far of an escalation this will be. Well, on tender hooks until we get that information and then that might set off some some even stronger moves, you know, depending on what's going on. I, I, you know, you, you have to, you can only understand some of the moves that are going on in markets by realizing that traders are starting to price for some extremely dark scenarios indeed. Uh, look just now, the yen has taken off and is 0.5% or so stronger against the US dollar. And in the backdrop that we've had where the only way for the yen seemed to be weaker, that speaks volumes about you know, the, the level of concern that is out there and the search that traders and investors are engaging in at a rapid pace for what are the safer assets we can go into in this situation. Yeah. You have to realize that a lot of these moves are open to reversal. So which are the ones that you yeah. feel more comfortable being in? You know, partly because I mean, treasuries attract because even when you realize they could you know, drop back again once the all clear sounds, as you put it, but at least treasuries are liquid enough that you can get in and out of them without worrying that you're not going to be able to do so at the time that you want to do it. Garfield, then, I mean, earlier this week, you know, following that Iran attack over the weekend, people, you know, oil traders were calling for a hundred dollar oil. It is a hundred dollar oil in sight now, you think? Uh, certainly. You know, when you consider that. Yeah, as I said, we're gaming out worst case scenarios. At the moment, we're flying in the dark. We don't have real confirmation of what any of this has actually involved and, and what the responses would be. But you know, one immediate, obvious, extreme measure that Iran can pull is to you know, close the Straits of Hormuz. And if you know, that would certainly send oil towards, if not beyond, $100 a barrel or, or, or set it well and truly on the path to it. So $100 a barrel looks more likely now than it looked a week ago uh, and significantly more likely perhaps than it did even you know, on, on Monday and Tuesday. That's not necessarily saying you want to build it in as your base case, but it's there. Yeah, it's certainly. You talked about the Strait of Hormuz. Of course, we haven't seen any disruptions as of yet. Yeah. But yeah, as you say, the, watching those flows very closely as well. Garfield, thank you so much for your time and really kind of staying, sticking through with us here this hour as we kind of basically we're ripping off the rundown here right now and just tracking what's going on across these markets. I want to bring in once again Annabelle Droolers, who's watching uh, all things GMM as well as your crypto markets here this morning. But let's start with what, what's on top of mind now. Well, I think it's really interesting because what you were just discussing there with Garfield, I mean, early this week we had uh, investors and traders we were talking to that saying $100 oil was not on the horizon. But actually, as we say, it is perhaps a, a greater risk really at this point in time, given this, this risk of a, a widening rift that we're seeing in the Middle East. And it's being reflected. We've already been tracking that move we're seeing in Brent crude, for instance, now above that $90 a barrel mark. You've got that gain in WTI. But also what's interesting in the last few minutes on the GMM function is that those petroleum products have as well started to see that gain there. Gas oil, for instance, heating oil. These are petroleum products rising off the back of that move that we're seeing here for crude generally. It's a big, big, big tone of risk aversion that you're seeing here. And it's probably feeding out the most right now in equities because you're starting to see those really statistically outsized moves for Taiwan. The Nikkei in particular, look at that drop there uh, below that 37,000 mark for the benchmark. Uh, currencies wise as well, big losses there. The Mexican peso, for instance, standing out nearly 2% weaker here. But it's a theme of general weakness for EM currencies in particular that have been really feeling the brunt of dollar strength, even over the course of this 
this week. But the likes of the Mexican peso, the Korean won, the Taiwanese dollar, the Philippine peso, all of those are EM currencies. The Aussie dollar, meanwhile, very sensitive, particularly commodity exposed. And you do have that drop there down eight tenths of one percent. Swiss franc, of course, it's that move that we are seeing now into those havens being expressed. They're nearly gaining one percent. We've even seen some gains for the Japanese yen. And broadly, it is that flight to safety here that you again see expressed through those moves in bonds. You've seen that rally. Yields are dropping off the back of that. How we are setting up for the day's trading, though, it is not looking great as we look ahead to the opens across Europe in particular. Uh, you're seeing Euro stocks there guiding for a drop of more than 2%, the likes of the German DAX as well. FTSE futures now looking for a, a contraction of 1.5%. So that's the state of play here. It is that story, really, I would say, worsening risk aversion that's coming through. So, Annabelle, obviously you've been looking at crypto assets uh, as we are in this uh, Bitcoin halving. How are these latest developments affecting the, the crypto ex markets? Well, it's not looking great. I mean, crypto, we know, is, a, again, a, a, an asset class that is very sensitive to geopolitical developments, very risk-reward risk, uh, risk uh, reward ratio very much in play when it comes to this asset class. And you see Bitcoin, for instance, here uh, dropping 4.7%. It has been that move that we've seen as well in those smaller secondary tokens, the likes of ETH, Solana as well. Uh, those are actually seeing an even greater contraction here, uh, given that we don't see the same sort of trend. Trading volumes are here. They're more thinly traded uh, tokens. Uh, but you are seeing the likes of Solana there down 7% at this time. Uh, Bitcoin, we actually saw it dropping early this week below that 60,000 mark. It'll be interesting to see, of course, how it develops through the session today. But uh, as well, just a few hours ago, we were near an all-time record high. Now quite a gap from that point in time. As you said, it is interesting, uh, given that we're just a few hours away now from the Bitcoin halving taking effect. All right, Annabelle Drillers, yeah, a lot going on here right now. Uh, you mentioned about Japan. You take a look at that year-to-date chart of the Nikkei 225, and you just show, it just goes to show, we've basically fallen uh, from uh, the March peak in, in a pretty substantial way. We're basically now uh, entering into that correction territory. You take a look at what we've been seeing here. So we're, we're still up about 10% year-to-date, but we basically have peaked uh, since uh, just about a month ago. So certainly there, that's one to watch here. We're also looking at just Japanese equities in general. We're set for the worst day since February of 2021, just today alone. The worst week we've seen since April of 2020. In fact, also the CSI 300 actually outperformed Japan in a big way just this week alone as well. Um, so we're obviously watching what goes on. WCRS, that's where you're seeing the, the dollar moves uh, in FX. And basically you're seeing every single currency getting hit by the dollar, with the exception there on the right there of the Swiss franc and the Japanese yen, which even now the yen is having a bit of a haven bid, a slight one compared to the Swiss franc, but it's there, uh, which goes to show how people are really kind of flocking to these traditional havens here right now, Steve. Yeah, and then just the latest news flow that's coming through, and it is trickling through. Uh, we're hearing uh, that Israel told the United States Thursday, U.S. time, it's Friday in Asia, Thursday, late Thursday in the United States, that Iran... Uh, that Israel had planned an Iran response within 24 to 48 hours. This is looking as though that this is that response. All right. I want to check oil now. Of course, that's seriously where we're seeing a lot of that movement here and that pop in, in Brent and WTI this hour. There you go. 3.6 percent are back to $90 for Bent, 85 bucks for WTI here on the reports of these explosions uh, in Iran. I want to bring in Vanana Hari now. She's joining us, founder of Vana Insights. Van, you know, Van, you know, Vanana, just tell us what's going on right now and your take so far. Yeah, it's not very clear, as you were just uh, alluding to it yourself. Uh, there appear to be news reports of an Israeli um, uh, missile strike on Iran. Now, um, of course, I think I would say let's be cautious. This could turn out to be a fa false alarm. But look, the situation in the oil market is such that uh, the geopolitical risk premium is high. The fear of a Middle East, a wider Middle East conflagration remains very high. Of course, we saw a bit of a de-escalation in tensions and we saw crude pulling back over the past three or four days. But um, but the, the, the fear of, um, of the situation still worsening. Uh, before it gets any better is is still very much intact. So that's what we're seeing in terms of crude's response this morning. Uh, 
a, a bit surprising and, and shocking. And I would say it still remains to be seen whether uh, that news uh, headlines uh, do turn out to be true. Now, Vandana, Stephen Engel here. Would you call this, I guess, on a Friday morning, a triple whammy? Uh, you know, we have the continuing, uh, you know, hawkish Fed. Uh, we have this news in the semiconductor industry uh, from TSMC essentially lowering its outlook for the chip uh, space going forward in 2024. And now this escalation in Mideast tensions, which with, with, with no certain outcome, obviously. Yeah, a, a lot bubbling away. But interestingly, I would uh, point at a divergence in sentiment in the broader financial markets and in the oil markets. So we have seen um, a quite a dramatic and sustained downturn uh, in economic sentiment, especially with regard to uh, investors um, tuning down their expectations for a Fed rate cut. And we've seen uh, a risk off environment. Uh, and almost in parallel, we've seen um, a lot of funds going into crude prices, into crude because of this geopolitical tensions. To my mind, what's interesting and would be worth watching is if uh, and when these geopolitical tensions in the Middle East do uh, come off the boil a little bit, uh, I would expect to see crude and the sentiment in the oil market reconnecting uh, with the downturn in the, the, the broader economic sentiment, at which point we should see crude continue to cool off. Uh, but as of now, it really looks difficult for the oil market to see past the very immediate danger of a worsening uh, geopolitical conflict and, and warfare even in the Middle East. Are we looking at a new trading range for, for crude then, Vandana? I mean, we were just talking to our colleague Garfield about $100 is probably a little bit more likely for crude now than it was maybe a week ago. Yeah, I would be cautious um, in just uh, in, in calling for a new range as such uh, right away. We have seen Brent uh, remain pretty stuck around $90 a barrel. And um, of course, it, it, it slipped back uh, uh, this earlier this week, but proved to be short lived. Um, it, a, a new range again, uh, you know, uh, are we talking about 100, 120? Uh, I don't think so. I, my base case remains that um, karma heads, yeah. are as difficult as it appears right now, karma heads will prevail. We know the U.S., there's an interesting Wall Street Journal report this morning. The U.S. is uh, making another diplomatic push with a, with a lot of uh, a, a package almost of trade-offs involving uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia and Israel and U.S., uh, in the region. So let's see what, what these diplomatic efforts uh, yield. And uh, we do yeah. know there's also a lot of pressure on Israel not to retaliate in kind to the to the Iranian attack. So let's uh, wait and watch, I would say. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a bull run from here, just because of what we're hearing and seeing this morning. Okay. So what, what, what's the response likely from OPEC plus then, and then, I'm wondering, because I think 90 bucks was something that was quite favorable, and, mm -hmm. and yet they're still holding on to these production cuts. Do you think that you know, what we're seeing in the Middle East is going to change the calculus in any way for them on, on what to do with production cuts moving forward? Yeah, I think that will depend a great deal on what prices do uh, between now and the 1st of June when the energy ministers uh, of OPEC Plus are due to meet uh, to decide what they want to do for the third quarter um, uh, production policy. Uh, there has been a, a bit of a consensus evolving in the market that um, at, with Brent ab above $90, and if it does sustain above $90 uh, until their meeting, then that does put pressure on uh, OPEC Plus to start unwinding some of its cuts, even if not completely um, uh, unraveling all of them. Uh, but, you know, if, what is, if prices are at current levels or higher, uh, is it because of uh, an actual supply disruption or is it just uh, the, the risk premium, the fear of supply disruption? I think that will make that question will make OPEC's decision difficult. But I do believe that they want to be seen as a stabilizing force. And, you know, as much as um, they want to protect uh, a floor to, to prices, I would imagine they would not want to be seen too hawkish, uh, especially if there are signs of economic headwinds. So uh, as of now, um, you know, whatever we can see uh, 
in the on the yeah. ground right now and on the horizon i think they'll probably uh, err on the side of uh, of easing a little yeah. bit but yeah. not all the way all right, Vanana, thank you so much for joining us on such short notice. Vanana Hari there, founder of Vanana Insights in Singapore. She says, look at things a bit cautiously as well. We're watching these Japanese markets. Of course, we talk about that 10% drawdown from that March peak. Steve, what else are you watching out for now? We're just getting more reports that Iran activating air defenses in multiple provinces, not just Isfahan, where we've gotten the reports of where these alleged Israeli missile and drone strikes have been happening or concentrated. This is Bloomberg. All right, just want to recap some of the latest lines that we're hearing when it comes to these explosions that we're hearing in Iran. So according to IRNA, the Iran has activated the air defense in multiple provinces right now. So it's not just Isfahan, as Steve had just alluded to earlier. And Israel did actually tell the U.S. on Thursday that it did plan an Iran response in 24 to 48 hours. So that was what we've been hearing from U.S. officials reportedly on that they were given maybe a bit of a heads up before these explosions took place. For more on what's going on, I want to bring in our Bloomberg editor, Michael Heath. He's been tracking the latest developments. And Michael, just bring us up to speed. What's the latest? Yeah, well, very much as, as you said, that the reports have come out of explosions in uh, central Iran and Isfahan, where there's a uh, military base, an Iranian military base. Um, and there were some reports also that, that might have been one of the launch sites for the, uh, for the weekend attack on Israel. Um, there's obviously been no confirmation about who's responsible for these blasts. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, US officials have said they were given a bit of a heads up by Israel that uh, there would be a retaliation in, in the next 24 or a response the next 24 to 48 hours. So it's the working assumption that it is Israel. We may never actually hear that officially anyway. Um, and as you mentioned as well, the, the um, airspace has been closed. Uh, markets obviously responding fairly strongly because the question then pops up about uh, where from here. Uh, Iran had said that it, we, it would basically consider the, um, the tit for tat done if Israel didn't respond. Um, Israel obviously has, has chosen to respond. Uh, I think it was, it was always going to be the case that Israel would. Um, one of its, its great deterrents is, is fear um, and, and the, the knowledge that Israel will strike heavily back at anyone who attacks it. So it, it sort of felt obliged to do this to show that um, it, it can't be hit and, and nothing come as a result of that. Michael, Steve Engel here. Is this a failure of detente of diplomacy? Steve, uh, yeah, look, I, I don't think it's a failure of diplomacy. I mean, between the US, Iran and Israel, I mean, there's, there's so much mistrust. Um, whether, whether anyone was ever going to be able to, to accept the other's word, um, it, it's hard to tell. I mean, the US officials, uh, as I understand it, had said to Israel when they were given the heads up that um, it has a lot of international sympathy now. That will dissipate, obviously, uh, if it chooses to strike, um, because it will sort of be seen as, as even. And, and there is an argument, too, that, you know, that, that Iran had totally failed in its attack, given that all those, um, or 99% of the 300-odd the drones and missiles were shot down. So, um, you know, Israel, in a sense, was in a good spot. But again, that sense of deterrence that, that Israel always wants to have, um, you know, known by other state actors in the Middle East region. It felt the need that it just had to reinforce that, and, uh, and here we are. Yeah, here we are, Michael. We still don't have all the details, obviously, but can we extrapolate? I mean, already Tehran had said they were willing to de-escalate and not further pursue this tit for tat if Israel backed off as well. Israel, obviously, if these reports are true and these were an Israeli missile and drone strike in Isfahar and potentially other places, do, does this then lead to potentially a change in Iran's position? Yes, Steve. I mean, that, that's the big question because Iran has been quite explicit about this, about saying that if Israel does nothing, they consider the matter closed. But now that Israel has chosen to, to retaliate in, in kind, Iran's been very public that, that, that it wouldn't tolerate that as well. So this is, this is the greatest concern that everybody's had in, in watching the conflict, that it would escalate, you know, the Gaza uh, war that we've seen, that it would escalate into a regional crisis. And this was what we seem to be on the, on the cusp of here. So it really is 
stands up to what Tehran considers here? Do they respond? I mean, there have been reports from Iran that they were prepared to respond immediately if Israel did this. Um, it would be surprising if they did. I think they'd need to confer and think about it. But we really are in a, entering un, uncharted territory here. I mean, this was obviously Iran's first attack on, on Israeli territory. Uh, now we've got Israel, uh, assuming uh, Israel has responded as well. Um, yes, it's very, very tense times we're in now. Could you say we're, we're, we're on, on the brink now of some sort of wider regional war, Michael? I'm just wondering, uh, what, what do we need to look out for for the next 12, 24 hours now? Oh, Yvonne, all eyes will be on anything coming out of Iran now. Um, statements through the, through, uh, coming from the UN, uh, its foreign minister was obviously in the US, um, and, and out of the news agencies there, and, and, and regional players as well, who are, who are seemingly going to be on the, on the phone to Tehran as well. But, you know, it, Iran, you know, it, it's, going to, it's going to have to, it's going to keep its counsel here, but uh, it, it's just such a, a worrying time. I mean, Will they respond? They, they sort of, it's almost like they're obliged to respond, given how, how strongly worded their, 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 um, their statements were in terms of if Israel stops, we'll stop as well. Um, it's just a matter of, of whether they see that it's too great a risk to go, to, uh, to, to go back at Israel again. And, um, and given Israel's response, it, it may, that may well be the case. I mean, there were also um, reports, and these are, these are I stress, totally unconfirmed, that uh, bases had been hit in Syria and Iraq as well. Um, there, there hasn't been much follow-up on, on that either. So, but Israel has definitely, if it is Israel, has made its point here. So, yeah, all eyes totally on Tehran now. Michael, does this put more pressure on Beijing uh, to use its influence in Tehran to, to you know, get cooler heads to prevail uh, there? Because we do know that they have an ear in Tehran, but so far, all quiet from the Beijing front. No comment yet. Yeah, it's a really good point, Steve. And, and I think um, the, the U.S. in particular would be marshalling everyone that they can possibly get hold of to try to... to to de-escalate, to get Iran to, to, to hold back here because no, it doesn't, it, it's outside of Israel and Iran, it serves nobody's interest whatsoever if this escalates. I mean, you know, the, the, the Middle East going up in flames is what people have feared for decades. And we noticed uh, there was a report yesterday as well that, um, that Indonesia had requested China um, make all efforts to try to get Iran to de-escalate as well. And you're right, uh, China does have, have an ear there, it does have an outlet there. So um, there, I, I suspect there'll be no doubt that China would be on the phone trying to de-escalate, trying to call heads there, um, because it is just such a dangerous situation. Michael, thank you so much for updating us on what's been going on. Great analysis there. Michael Heath, our editor, joining us out of Sydney with the latest. I want to get a check on these markets and bring in Bell again. Bell. Yeah, well, I think, as you said, it's this risk now that is building of a wider regional conflict, this tit-for-tat escalation, and you're seeing that really reflected here in that flight to safety that's coming through. Uh, you can see these big moves, and I'm going to talk through them in more detail, but what I first want to point out is just how synchronized the market reaction and how, how profound it has been or how market it has been the co over the course of this morning because every single asset here started to move as that first headline crossed. So firstly, you're taking a look at spot gold, for instance. We've been trading around record highs for that key commodity. Uh, of course, it is a, a one is, that is considered a, a, a haven asset as well, but trading up 2% at this point in time. VIX futures as well, you've seen that big spike there, uh, trading around 13% higher. The Japanese yen, again, that move into havens, and you're trading uh, about 6 tenths of percent stronger against the greenback, even as we see as well broad dollar strength coming in session. So it just tells you that concern that is feeding through the investment landscape. Uh, S&P 500 futures, likewise pointing to a pretty big drop and you've already seen a five-day sell-off for the U.S. benchmark here. That's the longest losing streak going back to October of last year. Uh, let's take a look though at broader markets now because GMM tells us that this is very broad base and there's a lot of different ways that you can slice and dice what's going on in the markets this morning. But WTI, uh, look at that big jump there. You've got up 4.3 percent today so far. You're seeing Brent crude, for instance, again, gaining above that key $90 a barrel level. Uh, early this week, we've been discussing with a lot of different guests, was $100 a barrel uh, even on the horizon? A lot of people we were speaking to were saying, no, that wasn't likely. They thought that these geopolitical tensions could remain constrained. But today you're seeing perhaps it's really uh, coming back as a key risk again that would have, of course, very big impacts uh, for the inflationary outlook. 
oil products as well. You can see those rises coming through in the likes of gas oil, heating oil as well. So that's the state of play that we see there in the commodities complex. But as I said, uh, it is some move in haven currencies, the likes of the Japanese yen, the Swiss franc. You can see they're gaining 1% at this point in time against the dollar. But big sell-offs in the emerging market currencies. You've got the likes of the Mexican peso, the Taiwanese dollar, the South Korean won, the Philippine peso. All of those are dropping against the dollar so far. But the Mexican peso, one to note, because you've actually just dropped below that 18, 18 level for it. Equities wise, again, it's a big sell off coming through here. Not great news coming into the day. We had the likes of TSMC, for instance, a weaker outlook, hawkish Fed speak, but again, really reflected so far. You've got the likes of the Thai X off nearly 4%, uh, the Nikkei just into its lunch break, but contracting more than 3%, and the likes of equity futures as well, pointing to further weakness. Euro stocks, German DAX, both of those looking to drop more than 2% at the open. All right, Belle, thank you so much. As you mentioned, with that Mexican peso, it is the biggest drop we've actually seen uh, since June of 2020 for that currency. So certainly we're feeling it here this morning across EMs, as Belle had mentioned. Uh, we're going to get to a break, I believe. Um, we'll get to the other side of this and see if any more updates have come through from the Middle East. We've got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. It has been a busy two hours, and we're still trying to recap what really has been going on the last couple of minutes or so. And this is what we're hearing so far from multiple reports across the board and some, uh, some semi-officials that have confirmed with us from state TV of a heavy blast that was heard in Isfahan province. Iran, according to the state news agency, has also activated the air defense in multiple provinces after what we've been hearing when it comes to explosions uh, in and around the Isfahan area. And, of course, the impact on airlines, Steve, as well. Yeah, that's right. So we're focusing our reporting on Isfahan, which is about 215 miles south of Tehran. It's home to an international airport. It's home to a military base uh, by the Iranian Air Force, I believe, as well as we're hearing some of Iran's nuclear facilities are in that area as well. There have been a number of different reports about the size and scope of this, uh, uh, if you want to call it, reported missile attack or and or drone attack as well, upwards of 100 missiles or some sort of projectiles, including drones. Again, I don't want to get ahead of myself because, again, these are reports from other news agencies. Until we get clearer picture of the size and scope of this, uh, the markets are going to be reacting as they have all morning, and that is a flight to safety. Yep, just pr press the sell button now and worry about it later. Uh, right now, we're still seeing that pr pretty pronounced moves across the board and this flight to safety here this morning. Uh, of course, as tensions flare in the Middle East, uh, we were talking about with Michael Heath too, Steve, about what China's role could be, right, as, as some sort of diplomatic efforts there. Our, our opinion columnist Karishma Vashwani says China could actually carve out a bigger diplomatic role for itself. She joins us now from Singapore. So Karishma, what, what sort of tangible things can Beijing do in this case? Yeah, you know, Yvonne, it is really uh, uncertain times, to say the least. But even in advance of this, earlier in the week, we did see Beijing try and take some action on this. Uh, there was a conversation between the two foreign ministers where, uh, you know, we did hear some sort of de-escalatory language from uh, the Iranian side. China, for its part, has consistently said that it wants tensions to come down, to de-escalate. And, you know, a lot of this has to be seen within the context of the U.S.-China relationship, which is often described, and understandably so, as fractious. And I think it is fair to say that Beijing took the opportunity uh, in this situation as well to sort of point out that, you know, this isn't simply a, a problem that's come out of nowhere. Good to see uh, you again. to the Biden administration's <laughs> lack of action yes, with the well uh, conflict yeah, between good. Israel it's and Hamas. Well. And birthday. suggested <laughs> that perhaps <laughs> that was the root of why all of this has happened. All right, we're having some difficulties there with our audio um, in, in our Singapore studios, but certainly an interesting way of, of looking at this right now, which is basically if China can do anything, and why haven't they done it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, they, they've tried. They did broker some detente between Tehran and Saudi Arabia, uh, but again, some of the proposals that Beijing has come forward with uh, sort of has been dismissed by the West as being either oversimplified or are not necessarily practical. So we'll have to see. Yep, certainly that's the case here. Um, 
All right. Uh, so obviously we can see more uh, breaking headlines here this morning. So uh, more from the U.S. side of things. So two U.S. officials are telling us that Israel struck targets in western Iran. Uh, there was also the state-run INR NA in the last couple of seconds is updating, saying that blast in Iran's northwestern Tabriz city as well. So this is what we're hearing so far. And Iran air defense is firing at an unknown object in Tabriz. This is according to IRNA. That one just dropped on our terminal here right now. Um, so it's a, it, it's a very fluid situation. Potentially a multi-pronged yes. strike. All right. I think we've established a connection back with Karishma. I want to bring her back in. Karishma, sorry, you know, we worked out some yeah. of the gremlins here. Maybe you could ask us, you know, help answer this one question. We talked about, you know, Beijing's response to this Iranian conflict so far has been quite muted. Why, why hasn't Beijing done more? Well, you know, I think, Yvonne, it is really important to point out that Beijing sees itself as a sort of global diplomat, particularly in the global south. But there are a lot of capacity issues within the foreign ministries in Beijing. They simply haven't had the experience that you see, you know, in the sort of capitals of London, in the UK, for instance, or in the United States, where there's been a long history of engagement with different parts of the world. This is a relatively new thing for China. And while it is still trying to build up its capacity, it also wants to build position itself as the, you know, arbiter of what is right, the sort of moral conscience yeah. for the global south. And that's the position it consistently takes. Well, Karishma, no time like the present to get that experience. Uh, we are hearing that Antony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, is heading to Beijing uh, as early as Monday. His, his travel plans might change given the recent events right now in the Middle East. But still, here's an opportunity for the U.S. and China to discuss these issues and get a tangible, real, workable, um, you know, detente led by Beijing, which definitely has the ear of Tehran. Yeah, 100%, Steve. And, you know, you and I have talked about this before as well. It's a real opportunity for China to sort of flex its diplomatic muscles. But at the same time, you know, you had the United States talking to China ahead uh, of what's happened this week to say, look, if you've got Tehran's ear, talk to them, de-escalate the situation. This is your moment. Now, it's interesting that China hasn't sort of gone full-fledged and done that. And I think primarily the reason is because ultimately the relationship between Iran and China is transactional. There's a sort of philosophical, ideological uh, relationship there as well. I mean, in terms of the antagonism they both share uh, about the West and in particular the U.S. influence in their different parts of the world. But at the core of their relationship, it's a commodity relationship relationship, right? China buys so much oil from Iran. And that is something that it does not want disturbed in any way. So I think that's why you're seeing a, a degree of reticence. Uh, on the one hand, it's trying to ensure that it uses this opportunity to, you know, make that jibe at the Biden administration. But on the, on the other hand, it also wants to protect its core interests with Iran. All right, Karishma, great stuff. Thank you so much for joining us. Our Bloomberg Opinion columnist Karishma Vishwani there speaking to us out of Singapore on what China's potential role could be in these geopolitical tensions in the Middle East here right now. We're, we're checking FX, of course. It's not just you know where equities are getting hit hard. It's really what we're seeing when it comes to Asia as well, when it comes to currencies. So the dollar is catching a bid. There you go. We're on track for a second week of gains for the Bloomberg Dollar Index. Uh, you've seen that intense weakening when it comes to the Korean won here, and we're ever so close to that 1,400 level. And you're seeing the yen. There you go, 153. We broke below 154, I think the first time in a few days. Uh, a few, I guess you could say, that even the yen is catching that safe haven bid here this morning. I want to bring in our FX reporter, Michael Wilson. He's with us now. Michael, obviously the situation has been fluid. There's been news left and right. I'm just wondering, now, does this only add more fuel to this dollar trade? Um, overall, and ultimately it probably does, um, you know, much to the uh, annoyance of uh, uh, Japanese authorities, but I think that this is a, a bit of a uh, well, I won't say a game changer, but um, you know they, they're just going to put their pens down for the next few days. You know, it's going to be a very long weekend. Um, we, you know, that uh, as it is now, Israel is still you know uh, responding you know uh, to Iran's um, uh, shower of drones. So, you know, how long that response um, you know takes? It could take and you know, it could continue all throughout New York Day tonight. Um, 
we've seen a lot of uh, you know the, 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 the safe havens or the, you know of you know historically um, the Swiss and the yen. Uh, the Swiss you know uh, uh, did surge. Um, it's got a fair way to go before it makes a, a fresh low. Uh, sorry, a fresh high. But um, you know there has been some really strong uh, buying of yen, but. I think that's more a case of um, unwinding of uh, like carry trade longs and um, you know positions that you would typically put on in, in a growth scenario, but with Japan as a you know, major importer of oil uh, for its energy needs, I think that uh, you know from, on that perspective uh, the yen might come off second best. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be you know fleeing to the uh, to the yen automatically as a haven. I'd probably have uh, more favour over the um, for the Swissy. And uh, I think that's how it's playing out in the markets than it is now. Um, you know, we don't know what the uh, Iranian response is going to be to this. Um, oil has jumped, obviously, but you know, if they would, um, I, I don't think it. You know, before this all started, you know, earlier this, a few hours ago, I don't think the intention was to uh, close the Straits of Hormuz. But you know, that if that happened, uh, you know, that they. You know, already given a good shake at uh, Israel with their drones, didn't scratch. You know, didn't scratch the paint. So if they really wanted to arc up and um, and, and pinch the world. Um, you know, if they were to close those, uh, you know, that 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 chokehold uh, on the oil movement, um, that could really cause some problems. And uh, it would that would take you know weeks to unwind. So uh, I think that this is the start of a, um, a prolonged uh, effort, which will suit the dollar. Um, you know, they've got that oil independence. Uh, whereas currencies um, who, you know, are pro-growth um, as they, you know, uh, finance a, um, uh, an imbalance in their, in right. their payments, um, I, think they're, I think they're in for it. And I think that includes the Aussie dollar and, and the Kiwi particularly, who is another oil importer as well. So, Right. Um, Michael, hold that thought. We have some lines crossing here from the Israel Defense Forces here. And now that they are talking about sirens sounded in northern Israel. Now, this is according to the, uh, what they've been posting on Telegram about this siren that's been sounded in northern Israel. We were just talking about how this blast uh, that has also, we apparently were hearing it in Iran's northwestern Tabriz city. That's going to the state-run IRNA as well. Michael... You know, before even this, this, these explosions and what's been going on this morning, there was a lot of chatter about the need for some sort of multilateral intervention, right? The fact that Jenny Yellen spoke with the Japanese and, and the Koreans this week does show that maybe there's more tolerance towards intervention. Are, are we likely, you know, heading into some sort of, you know, currency, something big happening in currencies right now where, you know, some were calling even a mini plaza accord? Uh, that's uh, right now. I think that if that was a, a big ask, um, you know, 24 hours ago, it's a huge ask now. But you know, the Plaza Accord was a global uh, thing that included Europe. But to uh, have some sort of accord just between Japan, um, Korea, you know, any of the other smaller countries as well, I think that's, um, you know, in the, the current economic um, pulse in the states, I think they'd, they'd probably be better weighted to um, the. Uh, uh, the U.S. curve um, turns a little bit, um, and this right now is not a good example. Obviously, uh, Treasury yields are off across the curve, but I think they just have yeah. to wait uh, until um, you know the the U.S. Um, uh, economic cycle turns, and they'd probably get a lot more bang for their dollar. And then, in terms of uh, coordination uh, in intervention, that falls 90 percent onto uh, Japan's shoulders. All right, we have some uh, further news and uh, getting some more clarification according to state television in Iran that the air defenses have activated against UAVs in Ifahan. Uh, essentially, UAVs are uncrewed aerial vehicles, otherwise known as drones, but unmanned, unpiloted. Uh, so that is the latest from state TV. Uh, again, Isfahan, uh, south of Tehran, about 215 uh, miles and has been at the center of a lot of these reports of a possible Israeli retaliatory strike against Iran. All right. Our thanks to Michael Wilson. We're bringing Annabelle Jewelers now, who's watching these markets for us. Bell. Yeah, well, first thing I want to point out, we've got the broader index at a session low here, but off more than 2%. Uh, every single sector in the red today, with the lone exception of energy, of course, we're seeing that big spike in Brent crude, WTI, quick check on some of those energy stocks in particular. And you are seeing investors really piling into some of the names in Japan and Korea. Uh, what else we're tracking, of course, is, is the, the drop that we're seeing in, in most parts of the markets and that move back in, guys, to the havens.
Yep. Certainly we'll be watching those, these market moves. It looks like nothing really, you know, we haven't seen too much stabilization just yet here. In fact, you take a look at what's been going on, your global macro movers, that's really where you're seeing a lot of that risk aversion and really that swept through this Friday morning. We have plenty more to come in Bloomberg Markets Asia. That's it for us here at The China Show. Keep it here at Bloomberg.